But basically the world seemed to hover around a maximum number of people of about half a billion. And then coal seemed to make uh, life a little bit easier and the population started to rise. By about 1900, when the use of oil became significantly increased, uh, the population was, was under 2 billion people. Unfortunately, since that time, the world population has increased to its current value of about six and one half billion people, and the world economy has, has expanded by a factor of about 30. Now, when humans started civilization, but with the agricultural revolution about 7,000 years ago, if you added up the weight of all of the human beings and their livestock together, compared it to weight of to the weight of all the vertebrates on Earth, that is animals with backbones, we were only 0.1% of the weight of vertebrates on Earth. That's the carrying capacity of the Earth under natural circumstances. But now humans and their livestock met 98% of the weight of all vertebrate land, the vertebrate animals on the surface of the Earth. And that only leaves 2% for all of the wild deer the wildebeests, the elephants, the frogs, the birds, the small mammals, the crocodiles, you name it. Now I am a, a medicopter and the term that we use for this kind of growth, unconstrained and uncontrollable growth, is cancer. Now actually if you look in detail you find that almost all of the growth in the world's population is happening in the undeveloped third world countries. However, if you look at the graph carefully, you see that the population in those countries has already started to fall. And that's fundamentally because the combined effects of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, war, and uh, climate change leading to crop failures and starvation is causing the death rate to exceed the absolutely enormously high birth rate. And so even in these African countries, the population is starting to decline. However, I would point out that what these figures conceal is an almost unimaginable degree of human suffering. Uh, it's also worth noting that in industrialized countries, in particular where women have the freedom to say no, have access to education, access to con contraception, the um, gr birth rate pretty well accurately ma matches the um, death rate and the population is fairly stable in those industrialized countries. So the next thing I want to talk about is declining per capita food production. As you can see from this diagram, the dotted lines show that in fact the total food production in the world has increased by a very impressive amount over the last 50 years or so but it has been at the expense of the environment the quality of the soils etc and it has been uh, riding on the back of plentiful cheap oil energy to drive the tractors and to drive the agricultural revolution however even despite all of these advantages the per capita food production in a number of places has started to fall in africa and in China in particular. The thing which worries me is that the world population is now six and a half billion and the natural carrying capacity of the earth is possibly half a billion people. So as uh, oil production declines, I'm very concerned that food production will decline and I'm very, very, very concerned that that means that many, many, many people will find themselves starving. We're also drawing down on capital. This is a graph, I took this from uh, Richard Heinberg's book, Power Down, in which you see the world production of grains and the world consumption or utilization of grains. And as you can see over the last few years, the consumption has exceeded production. The only way we've been able to do that is by drawing down on our reserves, our grain stocks. As you can see, the total grain production has been increasing, but so has the population. And in fact, um, uh, water shortages, especially in China, are why grain production has been falling since the mid-1980s.
now looking around me in New Zealand, it's very, very hard for me to understand that there's any problem with global environmental degradation because, in fact, New Zealand was rated number one in the Environmental Performance Index study of 2006 on a number of objective measures. We basically have the least spoiled and most pristine environment in the world. So we have to actually read and educate ourselves because we can't see it in our own backyard. However, many of you in the audience and the international audience will know what I'm talking about by looking out of their window. Now, approximately 1,360 experts from 95 countries were involved as authors of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. And this came out at the turn of the millennium. There were 80 lead authors, there were 850 reviewers, there was a 15-member assessment panel of leading social and natural scientists who oversaw the technical work of the assessment, supported by a secretariat with offices in Europe, North America, South America, Asia, Africa, and it was all coordinated by the United Nations Environmental Environment Programme. This is not somebody walking down the street with a cardboard over his back saying the end of the world is nigh. These are serious scientists. You see this shell here? This is the limpet. Patella is its scientific name. That shell is not changed for 500 million years. This little limpet discovered a happy way to live on the rocks that was sustainable. The waves washed over it, it found enough to live on, and it was happy. But some descendants of this limpet found a, a, a friendly pool to live in. They became sophisticated, they changed. They became extraordinarily successful. They proliferated. They, they grew and they grew and they were very, very successful in this little pool until suddenly geological conditions changed, climate changed, and the pool dried up. Now these sophisticated descendants didn't find out how to go back to the simplicity of the little limpet, and they died out. They died out. 